So again, welcome back everyone. Um, we're gonna be talking about databases for chemical, spectral and biological data. Um, the lab that you guys went through um, was uh, mostly just to, to give you a, a flavor of things. Um, and what you'll find is that in, in a number of the labs, the way we'll do it is we'll give you a few slides sort of as pointers, um, and then we'll let you go to it where you can work on your own. You don't need to move at the pace that we move when we're just giving you the, the quick overview. And of course, the intent is that you can download the slides and use those as a guide uh, if you've got a separate terminal or if you printed them off, then that way you can uh, use them to, to get you through the process. Um, this time, unfortunately, I guess we had a few minor changes to the, the layout, so that may have caused a little bit of confusion. Uh, working in these times of COVID is obviously a, a, little, a little tougher than we've all been used to. Um, if you didn't get the, the things to work uh, in the hour or so that we had, there is the time after this uh, we've set aside for uh, you know an hour, hour and a half of additional lab work uh, where you can try your hand at a few of the other um, uh, data sets we have. Um, and uh, that, that is an opportunity for you to, to explore things a little more, more closely. Um, so this is module three instead of module two. Um, and what we're going to be learning about are the different databases and database models. We're learning about um, a range of metabolomic databases, which are used by various programs and groups to help with uh, compound annotation. And that's a, you know, a common theme for today where we've been learning about whether it's NMR or GCMS or LCMS uh, to get um, annotations or names to those peaks and at least something about their concentrations or relative concentrations. Tomorrow, as I said, we'll be focusing on interpreting that data. But I'm also going to highlight some databases, particularly like things called pathway databases, which are linked to um, tools like MetaboAnalyst. Uh, but on their own also help a lot with the interpretation. Um, so I've mentioned two terms before, uh, the words bioinformatics and cheminformatics. Uh, almost all of you have heard of bioinformatics. So this is what CBW is named after. So that's doing um, computational work for biological um, substances, proteins, DNA, RNA. Chem informatics um, is sort of a separate field that um, developed uh, specifically for chemical compounds and for chemistry. Um, and it's sort of had its own path. And those two fields have only recently started interacting. Um, in terms of uh, chem informatics, it's actually an older field. It's been around since the 1960s. It was developed uh, specifically for organic chemists. And back in the 1960s, most software and most computer systems were uh, commercial. Um, so the concept of being able to access chem chemical data uh, historically was you buy it from companies. Uh, there are large companies, Chemical Abstract Service being one of the most significant ones, Sigma, MDL, Bielstein. These are all organizations that have um, were established or have been making money, millions of dollars a year, by selling chemical information. And in the world of bioinformatics, um, a field is newer. Uh, it, it really picked up steam in the early 90s. Uh, it was specifically targeted for people in, in the field of molecular biology, protein chemistry, genetics. And instead of uh, commercial software, the idea was to have web-based open access, which is what this course is. And in fact, most bioinformatics software has been funded by federal governments. Um, Genome Canada, CIHR, the NIH, uh, NCBI, EBI, uh, have all put in hundreds of millions of dollars to help with the development and maintenance of uh, bioinformatics resources and databases. So there's, there are two different cultures, and I think that's important to understand some of the challenges that, that we're still facing in, in the field of metabolomics, which tries to blend both cheminformatics with bioinformatics. Now, key to almost all of these techniques, uh, cheminformatics, bioinformatics, whatever, is a database. 
So databases help consolidate informa information, they link information, they help with data retrieval, data queries. Databases are supposed to contain reference data. So they can contain numbers or images. Obviously in, in bioinformatics, they include sequences. Um, many people use databases as a, as a collection to help train and test predictive algorithms. Um, they're also used frequently for things like similarity searching. So whether it's looking for similar images, probably all of you have done that for on Google, uh, similar spectra, similar structure, similar sequence, similar text. Um, you can, and we'll show you that you can do this in many resources. Uh, it's common, uh, certainly in bioinformatics, it's common in cheminformatics. The other thing that databases help do is not only assist with the training of prediction algorithms, but they also can be used to facilitate prediction. So in bioinformatics, people use it to predict things like uh, phylogeny or relationships or properties, but we also do the same thing in cheminformatics to predict structures and function and spectra and relationships. So the, the, the core uh, of a lot of the world, informatics world is based on databases. I've been involved in the creation of many, many databases over my lifetime, and this is how many of them evolve. Uh, many cases I start making a database on my computer and it's done in an Excel spreadsheet or even just a Word file. Um, it's a hobby and then you realize actually some people may need this and so what you do is you start expanding the database. In my case I usually bring on some graduate students or hire some summer students and we start adding to the database and we make it a little more extensive. We make it relational, we'll put it into a warehouse. Um, and then if the database seems to be really taking off, we may end up um, creating a, not only a curated database, but an archival database. That's a database where other people can deposit it. it means there's open deposition, whereas a curated database, it's, it's, a, it's still an internal database. As you move from the hobby database to the archival databases, you move from things that might be just a, a tiny collection of sequences to something like GenBank, or a tiny collection of chemical structures to something that's as large as PubChem. Um, there's a progression in terms of the coverage and, and the depth. Now, some databases tend to be very deep, uh, but not very broad. Others can be very broad, but not very deep. And the larger they get, generally archival databases are not particularly um, great in terms of depth. Now, the size of the database, as it increases, so too does the size of the user community, and so do the costs of maintaining the database. So archival databases like GenBank, like Uniprot, uh, like many others, are incredibly expensive to maintain. Um, uh, in our case, my work in my lab has been creating curated databases. Those are a little cheaper to, to maintain, but they still cost a lot in terms of time. Um, as things uh, evolve, typically as you go from the hobby database to archival database, of course, things have to be more standardized, uh, depend more on automation, and you also expand the querying capabilities. As I mentioned, uh, and this is a slide you've seen before, is that this, the, the key problem in metabolomics traditionally has been the lack of databases or servers that access databases so that you could upload spectra and get an answer. So today you were given examples where you could upload spectra into Bazel, upload spectra into GC Autofit, upload spectra into Metabolanist R, and you could get metabolite identifications and or concentrations. So that problem is slowly being overcome, but all of those databases and all of those servers that we have depend on databases. So, the challenge still with metabolomics is that most of the data on chemicals is still in textbooks or print journals. Um, there have been hundreds of thousands of papers and journals and books published over more than a hundred years, covering both clinical chemistry, classical biochemistry, natural product chemistry, toxicology, environmental chemistry. The other thing to remember if you're coming from the field of proteomics or genomics is that metabolomics lags behind genomics and proteomics. Maybe 20 years is an exaggeration, but um, it, it, it doesn't have the infrastructure um, that those other fields have. The other thing is that because of diversity in chemistry, 
you're often trying to deal with different user communities and user needs. Uh, some chemical databases are great for organic chemists, but they're useless to physicians. Some spectral databases are great for uh, NMR spectroscopists, but they're useless to mass spectroscopists. Some databases are structured only for cheminformaticians, but they don't allow bioinformaticians to work. Some are very non-standard, some are very standard compliant. Some are what are called fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Others, most of them are, are not. So this broad collection of communities makes curation of databases um, in metabolomics also challenging. So I'm gonna talk about five different groups or classes of databases for metabolomics. I'm gonna talk about general compound databases. I'm gonna talk about experimental uh, spectral databases where they've got reference spectra. I'm gonna talk about predicted spectral databases, organism specific databases and pathway databases. Compound databases um, usually have large numbers of compounds from many different sources in organisms. And they are for um, level three identification, simple identification or putative identification or class. The experimental spectral databases um, are these reference databases. They allow you to get up to level two identification. MS, MS spectra, uh, the predicted ones, potentially allow you to get um, level two. Organism specific databases greatly narrow down um, the possibilities and often give you a pretty solid idea of what you're looking at. And pathway databases help with data interpretation. So I've mentioned this before and I'll just reiterate again. Um, level one, level two, level three, and level four are the levels that we use for metabolite identification. You can use them for both NMR and for MS. These are part of the Metabolomic Standards Initiative. They're rewriting these levels over this next year and slightly modified versions will be coming out soon. As I said before, level one requires an authentic compound, uh, an authentic standard. So very rarely do people actually reach that. Most people are identifying compounds at the level of level two. And this means you're matching to reference spectra. These are the spectral databases. Level three means you're matching to molecular formulas or mass to charge. And then the vast majority of compounds, and especially on targeted um, studies, fall into level four. They're just simply unknown. They're features, they have a mass, they maybe have a retention time, but that's it. So we, we highlighted the strength of having molecular formulas using the seven golden rules, some of the other software tools that are available that allow you to take high resolution mass data to get, and to get a pretty good estimate of what the actual molecular formula is. Once you have a molecular formula, then you can start querying databases to say, what is the structure possibly? And sometimes that can be uh, very helpful. So two of the largest databases for chemical formulas and chemicals in general are ChemSpider and PubChem. So PubChem uh, has got almost 100 million compounds. Uh, there's probably around 50 million compounds that are quote, hidden, uh, that are in the database, but not accessible to everyone. Uh, there's certain limitations. Uh, the compounds have to be less than a thousand atoms, which means that they could have molecular weights in the order of, you know, um, 5,000, 10,000 Daltons possibly. Um, so it's not purely small molecules. It's a collection of many, many uh, other databases. So it's a database of databases. Um, they distinguish between substances and compounds. Substances uh, can have duplicates, um, they can be impure compounds, are pure single compounds. There's a lot of information and every year PubChem actually gets richer and richer in terms of the data that it contains. Uh, and there's a lot of effort to expand on it. Um, it's quite searchable, you can get, uh, you can search by name, chemical formula, molecular weight range, um, structure, or a whole variety of other um, search capabilities. ChemSpider is a little different. Uh, it's maintained in the UK. It's a smaller collection of compounds, uh, about 20 or 30% smaller, uh, but has more data sources. And it also draws on more data. So it will have uh, spectral data, um, have pharmacological links. Um, it does link to MeSH. Um, and it has links to Wikipedia articles along with some descriptions. It's spotty. However, ChemSpider, um, 
um, isn't been as well maintained as, as uh, PubChem over the last couple of years, uh, partly because of some changes with staffing. Um, you can do molecular weight searches. Uh, you can do formula searches. You can look at ranges. Uh, here I've typed in a looking for molecular weights between 89 and 89.099 Daltons. Uh, I'll get a list, in this case, 408 possible compounds with this molecular weight range. Um, and of course, you could spend a few hours sort of combing through to see if any of these things seem reasonable or not. As I mentioned before, the vast majority of compounds in PubChem um, have never left the lab. In fact, some of them may not even exist in reality. Uh, they include lots of, um, I would say, putative compounds that people have used in uh, chemical libraries, of which there's no evidence that those chemical libraries are actually containing those compounds. Um, what I want to highlight here is, is sort of picking up on where I was commenting about the type of compounds. Uh, trying to match molecular weights or derive molecular weights at M over Z values to these databases is a mistake. Um, the estimates are that, that less than 0.01% uh, of these compounds have actually left the lab. So that means if they haven't left the lab, they are not in the environment. They're not going to be found in trees or plants or in your body or in parasites or microbes or waterfowl. Um, so if you have a database where 99% or 99.9% .9 of the compounds are not by definition or cannot by no definition be in the environment, this is not the way of looking for compound matches. Um, so what you can do is narrow things down to look for um, databases that are more focused on biological compounds. Um, KEBI is an example. It's a collection of chemicals of biological interest. So it includes plant compounds and insect compounds and mammalian compounds and even drugs. Um, there's knapsack, which covers a whole range of different plant compounds. There's lipid maps, which covers a whole range of different lipids from a wide variety of, of, of organisms. And then another one, which is called my compound ID, which I'll talk about. So KEBI has around 60,000 compounds. Uh, it's collected from a wide variety of areas. Um, it's been focusing more and more on enhancing its ontology. Uh, it focuses a lot on getting proper synonyms and formulas and structures. And you can search KEBI by name, formula, and structure. So if you have a biological sample and you're trying to figure out what does my molecular formula or what does my M over Z value match, this may be a better database to search than PubChem or, or ChemSpider. So yeah, David, uh, yeah. sorry, quick question. So how much overlap is there between these databases? There, there's no attempt whatsoever to be exclusionary just in one database and not the other, I presume. That's right. I mean, you will find most of the compounds in KEBI are in PubChem or ChemSpider, but um, yeah. you can't obviously detect that. So you'll, along with, you know, if you do a, a mass search or molecular weight search or formula search, um, PubChem will return all of them. So you can't say, just select the KEBI compounds um, yeah. in PubChem. Um, so you basically have to go to... Um, the three databases or four databases or whatever. That's right, yeah. Okay. So KEBI, as I say, includes many things. So if you are looking at, you know, let's say E. coli, KEBI doesn't cover all of the E. coli. It doesn't even cover all the human metabolites. It covers a few of them, and it covers a few E. coli metabolites. It covers a few plant metabolites, and these are kind of just randomly chosen. Not sure why and how they choose them, but that's so. It's a collection of different biological compounds. Knapsack um, has a focus on plants, but it's all plants. So if you're trying to look at carrots and bananas or ginseng, it'll have them, but um, not necessarily always tied to the species and not necessarily very thorough for certain types of, of plants. Lipid maps is, is a great resource for lipids, but it doesn't cover you know, organic acids or amino acids. Um, and it includes lipids from a variety of different um, uh, organisms. So not just mammalian lipids, but you'll get insect lipids or fish lipids or 
plant lipids. I'll talk about my compound ID a little later. Well, now I guess I will. So this is a, a very different database, and it's uh, one where there are no structures, but there are molecular weights, um, or um, M over Z values. And it took a small number of uh, compounds from the human metabolome database about almost 10 years ago, uh, 8,000 of them, and then it ran them through 76 different metabolic transformations. And it's done it through one pass and then through two passes. So um, roughly 76 times 8,000 gave them about 30, 400,000 feasible structures. Um, and then 76 times 375,000 gave them about 10 million feasible structures from second pass. As I say, these are not structures, but the key with my, my compound ID or the revelation was that many of the unknown compounds that you guys can't identify are probably metabolites of metabolites. These are the things I like call the second ohm or biological transformations of drugs or biological transformations of food. And uh, more and more, this seems to be the case that, that we're finding these unknown, unidentifiable metabolites are just variations of known metabolites, but they've gone through phase one or phase two or microbial biotransformations. So my compound ID is accessible. It hasn't been updated that recently, but it, it, it has helped a number of people suggest or identify possible structures. Um, these are examples of the molecular weights and the transformations. So it doesn't generate a structure and the structures aren't necessarily verifiable. So it, it gives a hint. It's not, um, you know, it is not as thorough as, as say Kebi or HMDB or even PubChem and the fact that those provide structures and, and references and a whole bunch of other things. But this does allow you to look at possible biotransformations. And um, for the real compounds, which it started with, at least from those um, where it has an HMD identifier, it links directly back to HMDB. So I think it's important that if you are using molecular weights or molecular formulas or M over Z values to identify compounds, that you choose the right database that you treat the results suitably skeptically, that you understand that these are only good for level three identification, and that information about the biology or the organism is, is key. People doing higher quality metabolomic studies work with um, compound identification via spectral matching. So these uh, next sets of databases are more important, and this is how most of the community is, is at least now moved towards, which is to use experimental spectra and experimental spectral matching. And this is level two identification. And you can do this for NMR or you can do this for mass spec. And uh, still level one requires authentic compounds, unless you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars getting a library of authentic compounds. Most of us are stuck at using level two identification where we match to spectral databases. So in terms of NMR, there's a number of databases specific for NMR, um, the spectral database in Japan or SBDBS, uh, the Biomag Res Bank, NMR Shift EB. Um, this is a, a database maintained in Japan. It's mostly for organic compounds. It has carbon NMR, proton NMR, it even has infrared spectroscopy, the MS data as well. It's a bit of a weird database because it limits how many times you can access it. Um, it has various rules. It doesn't have a whole range of uh, frequencies for NMR, uh, so that's a little limiting as well. But there are lots of spectra, um, you know, 14,000 NMR spectra, 54,000 IR spectra, um, covering quite a number of compounds. Um, most of the compounds in this database are not metabolites, but they are uh, arise from um, organic synthetic efforts. On the other hand, a database called Biomag ResBank uh, does have compounds that are metabolites. Um, this database was originally established for proteins and protein NMR. And my background is in protein NMR, so I was very much aware of this database and helped um, launch it many years ago. But over time, they realized that um, people also wanted to put metabolites in it. 
And when they introduced metabolites, um, the popularity of this database shot through the roof. So it does provide a lot of um, data, about 400 uh, reference um, compounds have an average of five to six NMR spectra. Um, they have 1D and 2D spectra. They have information about the names and cinema, synonyms and smiles. Initially, most of the focus was on plant, but they've now expanded to many other mammalian metabolites and they have assigned all of the spectra, which is a lot of work. And so this is a useful tool for not only compound identification by NMR, but also for uh, doing things like prediction. Another database which is maintained in Germany, and it was originally started by Chris Steinbeck, who ran um, Metabolites and Kebby for many years, um, is NMR Shift DB, or a second version now, NMR Shift DB2. Um, it also has a large number of spectra and, and structures. Again, most of these compounds are organic synthetic ones, they're not metabolites. Um, but um, it has uh, tools for chemical shift prediction, and you can search by structures or chemical shift peaks, and it has a number of chemical shift assignments. So those are the NMR spectral databases. Um, obviously, there's a spectral database in, um, uh, for NMR and HMDB. There are NMR spectral databases uh, used in um, both Magmet and Basil, uh, and there's NMR spectral databases in the Konomics uh, software as well. If we jump to mass spec, um, we've talked a little bit about this before. So the NIST database, um, the NIST 20, um, for GCMS as well as LCMS. I've mentioned the Metlin database, which is linked to XCMS. And then there are these mass bank databases, mass bank in Europe, mass bank Japan, mass bank of North America. These have large collections of experimental and even theoretical spectra. So the Metlin database, I guess, is getting up to around 850,000 compounds, uh, which is absolutely astonishing because even just a few years ago, they only had about um, four or 5,000 compounds. They were able to access large numbers of lipids, apparently, and natural products from a variety of lab libraries and have been collecting um, literally millions of MSMS spectra. They've also run, um, uh, I guess at least 80,000 compounds where they have experimental MS spectra. And um, it has recently been, um, I guess, made available through commercial purchases. Um, although we've been inquiring for a couple months now and they say it's almost ready. Um, and it looks to be about $5,000. You can access, anyone can access the Metlin database, but you have to log in and register. Um, so it's a remarkable resource and it's expanded very significantly in the last uh, couple of years. So you can do mass searches. Uh, you can look in neutral, positive and negative modes. You can go through tolerance. You can select which addicts you want. Um, you can click on a, uh, uh, an entry and see the mass spectrum. Um, and uh, unfortunately you can't download them. And so, um, it, it's still not as accessible, I think, as uh, the open source community would like. Now, MassBank is another resource which is open. Uh, you can download Spectra, um, and it is essentially networked across uh, Europe, and Japan, and the US. It covers Spectra from many platforms, just like Metlin. A uh, much smaller number, though, about 80,000 Spectra from about 14,000 compounds. It's an archival database, whereas the Metlin database is a database that's curated. So all the spectra in the Metlin database come from Gary Schustak's lab, whereas the spectra in MassBank, Mona, and others come from many, many labs around the world. So you can search by keywords, you can select instrument types, you can choose by exact mass, you can do formula, there's tolerance, you can search by inchy key or splash. Um, looking for peaks and peak lists. Um, it's a fairly simple interface. And as I say, it's similar both to European and the Japanese version. Uh, you can enter a list of peaks and then um, send off uh, a query to see what matches. And based on this set of queries, these are the uh, molecules that, that matched to uh, the spectra uh, that we queried. So you can 
um, manually enter peak lists and then manually uh, query and get the results for matching molecules. So another version of MassBank is called MassBank of North America, and it's maintained by Oliver Fien. Um, and um, it includes many other sources and is substantially larger than MassBank Japan and MassBank Europe, partly because it includes a lot of predicted MSMS MS spectra. And I'll get into the idea of predicted spectra a little later. Uh, so it uses lipid blast to predict lipid spectra, but it also has experimental spectra. Um, it ranks the rate, uh, quality of the spectra, um, and you can do standard upload, download, um, and spectral searches and, and queries. Um, these are some of the statistics on it um, and some of the sources. It draws it from Human Metabolome Databank, MassBank, GNPS, Prime, and Data in PubChem. It's used in software like NIST and MS Dial uh, and other vendors, um, and it follows the standard FAIR principles. So if you look at, at the number of uh, spectral databases, uh, at least where they have MSMS, authentic MSMS spectra, not just MS spectra, um, there sort of breaks down this way. So Mona has a very large number, many of which are theoretical. So it's about 12,000 compounds where there's authentic MSMS spectra. Metlin has about 80,000 compounds with authentic MSMS spectra. CFMID, which I'll talk to you about, has about 21,000 compounds with authentic MS spectra. But both CFMID and MONA have predicted spectra and predicted compounds. There are other resources like MZ Cloud, which has um, recalculated MS squared, MS cubed, MS to the fourth power spectra for about 8,000 compounds. And NIST databases around 13 to 14,000 compounds, MassBank 14,000, and so on. There's a fair bit of redundancy. So when you look at all, this, all the databases all together, have about 85,000 compounds with MS, MS spectra. So even though the numbers are impressive, like you know, 500,000, 200,000 compounds, that either includes just um, only MS compound, MS spectra, or theoretical. So um, certainly the size of MS spectral databases is, is greater than NMR, but it is not sufficiently large to actually help with identification of many metabolites. Because many of these compounds actually aren't metabolites. They're just things that you could pull off the shelf or that were easily accessible. So we have this numbers game where, you know, based on the number of chemical formula, we can expect there's about 32 billion chemicals, about 2.4 billion would be chemically feasible. We know that there's about 160 million compounds that have ever been registered in PubChem or CAS. We know that there's about 1.5 million spectra uh, in LC and GCMS. We know that there's about 30, 300,000 chemicals with EIMS data. There's only 85,000 chemicals with high resolution MS, MS data, and about 800 metabolites um, with high resolution NMR. So as we get down this filter, um, there's relatively few compounds for NMR, not that many for MS, MS, somewhat more for EIMS, but only a fraction of the actual you know, chemical universe is covered um, by these, or even the metabolomic universe. How many so compounds have uh, patents on them? You can include patents, and, and those are often accessible. Um, there's still, you know, information about them is is accessible. You're just not supposed to synthesize and sell them. Um, but yeah, yeah there, there is. But so, so how many? So how many compounds have been patented? I guess is my question. Um, I am not sure. I think it's it's several hundred thousand. Um, I believe have patents. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry for this. No, that's fine. So given the lack of experimental spectra, which are needed to do um, compound identification, we're, we're facing a dilemma in the world of metabolomics. 
we could either systematically, just as the Human Genome Project did, systematically sequence you know, the human genome or all these other genomes. So in the case of metabolomics, we can try and synthesize all the, all the known metabolites. We have structures, we have likely ones. Uh, we could also modify them, run them through you know, artificial livers and artificial guts, which will generate modified versions. We can purify them from natural products. We have this massive effort, you know, it cost a billion dollars to sequence the human genome. The estimate right now is it would be between five and $10 billion at least to try and generate the estimated 5 million compounds that we need to complete uh, the metabolome. And it's not just the human metabolome, it's the plant and microbial metabolome. That's not gonna happen. Um, and it's not gonna happen in a short period of time either because synthesizing, isolating, purifying chemicals is not fast, not as fast as sequencing. So the feeling is that the only way that metabolomics can kind of play the same game and to get around all these unknown or unknown unknowns, or it's called the dark matter of the metabolome, is to move towards uh, computational predictions. Uh, to computationally predict spectra, NMR, MS, um, and to even predict um, compounds predict the biotransformations of those. That's a lot cheaper. Instead of billions of dollars, it's measured in hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's also feasible. So that segues into this idea of predicted um, spectral databases, where we take the compounds that we know about and we generate uh, their likely um, fragmentation patterns. So, Believe it or not, the very first artificial intelligence programs written in the 1960s um, were designed to do MS-MS prediction. So the field of artificial intelligence and machine le learning was launched with the concept of predicting MS-MS spectra from compounds. Now, back in the 60s, they probably couldn't get very far. Um, mass spectrometers weren't great and computers weren't great either. But efforts have continued and, and one of the more successful efforts is this thing called CFMID, Competitive Fragment Modeling. It's a project that grew out of um, some people here at the University of Alberta to reanalyze how we predict uh, MSMS spectra and to look at how, if we had a compound, how accurately we could predict both the EI MS and the ESI MSMS spectra. So it's now uh, evolved. So it's a web server and it's gone through several iterations. It trained on a large number of spectra, uh, some of them from Metlin, some of them from other resources at different collision energies. So I mentioned now mass spectra require, uh, at least to get the MSMS, you have to have a collision cell and you have different energies uh, that fragment the molecule. The data is from a QTOF MSMS and it essentially, uh, learns by experience. It slowly learns through a hidden Markov model uh, where things should fragment and how things should fragment. It's been entered into another number of contests and is one um, and has been progressively getting more and more accurate. Right now it has about 330,000 computationally generated ESI MSMS spectra from 100,000 compounds in the HMDB. Uh, it also has predicted spectra from KEG, um, and it also contains a lot of experimentally collected spectra uh, from about 22,000 compounds. In addition to using machine learning techniques, the latest versions of, of CFMID have also used rule-based methods to predict um, MSMS spectra for lipids, acylcarnitines, polyphenols, and others. So it's been getting progressively smarter, if you want, progressively faster, and has been used to generate more and more MSMS MS spectra for things that we will probably never ever get uh, MSMS MS spectra for. It also does a lot or has generated many, many EI MS spectra. And uh, I won't get into that now, but so an example of the lipid predictions um, are shown on the right. This is CFMID. So the blue is the experimental spectrum and the red is the predicted spectrum. On the left side is the lipid blast version for the same molecule. Blue is the predicted and red is, or blue is the observed and red is predicted. 
we evaluate the quality of a prediction uh, math, in mass spectra through a Jacquard score. Uh, you can also use something called a dice score. A Jacquard score of one means it's perfect and a Jacquard score of 0.28 is meaning it's not great. Um, so um, CFMID turns out both on its machine learned and um, on its um, rule-based uh, methods to be quite accurate. So it's gone through several iterations. Um, in 2006, uh, it was able to get about uh, 55, 60% correct on a special test. It did very poorly in lipids and the, the dice or Jacquard scores weren't perfect. So we made improvements to the lipids and then it went in through the same test again um, where the test data set and the performance jumped to around 72%. More recently, we've upgraded the machine learning tools uh, and used additional neural nets and the performance improved all across the board in terms of predicted spectra. And now it's up to around a uh, little under 80% at being able to predict um, a compound from uh, a mass spectrum, a predicted mass spectrum. So let's say you've got your MSMS spectrum and you say, I have no idea what it is. It doesn't match to anything in the database or it doesn't match to anything I can find. Um, you can use CFMID and odds of getting a match or prediction are about uh, 75 or 80%. So with CFMID, you can do compound identification if you've got spectra. You can also take spectra that you've collected and it will do peak assignments. Um, you can also take um, structures that you've drawn or structures that you're thinking of or structures that people have sent to you and it will do MSMS spectral prediction. So there are three tasks that it can do. Most people are interested in the compound identification, but uh, people who really like mass spec, uh, like the peak assignment possibilities and, and people who are doing de novo compound identification, really like the spectral prediction properties. Um, you can, once you've got, if you're trying to do predictions, you can say, okay, I just wanna predict only or identify a compound purely from the predicted database, or you can choose its own collection of spectral databases. And there's up to seven or eight of them. Uh, you tell it what type of spectrum, a mode, paradigm mass, mass tolerance. And then below there, you can paste in uh, the different uh, peaks. So you can put in the 10 electron volt, that's the 20 electron volt and the 40 electron volt collision energies. You can do it for one or two or three. Um, um, actually, the more information that, or more spectra you have at different collision energies, the more accurate it is. But most people just submit um, data for one collision energy. So it takes a few seconds and once it's uh, run things, then it, it provides a list of the compounds that it matches. Um, the overall score, uh, the similarity, and then links to different databases. It also provides information about the source, um, whether it's predicted or known, or whether it's, um, or which, which database in particular. Um, you can also compare the spectrum, uh, both with your input spectrum and the peak intensities to the predicted uh, spectrum, and vice versa. Um, as you can see, it's not perfect. Uh, the intensities don't match always, but um, in the case of mass spectra, um, you never see a perfect match. Um, you can hover over things uh, and it will identify the specific fragments and uh, it is able to figure out what the fragments are. What CFMID is, I guess, part of the leading trend towards in silico or reference-free metabolomics. It's basically the community throwing up its hands and saying, we surrender, that we're never gonna be able to afford or ever be able to get all of the reference spectra for all the compounds that we know exist in nature. So we have to move to something that's more computationally based. Um, and by, not having to resort to synthesize or resynthesizing compounds, of course, it's cheaper, it's easier, it's faster. Um, the other point about CFMID is it does provide um, provenance. It tells you which source organism things are from. 
So my beef has been that at many um, uh, databases, including Kebby, um, including PubChem, um, including Lipid Maps, uh, including the databases like Mona and Metlin, don't tell you where the compound is from, um, whether it's E. coli or um, plant or human or food or contaminant. Um, without that information, you you can end up thinking you're seeing, you know, licorice products and drug products in in E. coli, and they don't do drugs and they don't eat licorice. So this goes to the point about trying to use organism specific databases. Um, and this is an important thing that the community really needs to move towards. So I entered I, the, the most common mistake was using, you know, large databases, thinking that big databases are better, but not realizing that most of the compounds in big databases are not biological. But even searching against these really excellent databases like NIST or Metlin or MassBank or Mona can still lead to lots of false positives because they mix um, the compounds or spectra from many, many different organisms. They don't distinguish them. So they throw metabolites from insects, from fungus, from medicinal plants and microbes, from foods and from pollutants, and they throw them all together and say, you know, take it. Um, they don't have a clear provenance. We don't know where they're from. And when we do metabolomics, we usually know which organism we're looking at. Um, we also often structure things so that we're analyzing if it's a lab rat, we know exactly what we fed it. If it's a microbe, we know exactly how we've grown it. Uh, if, if it's humans, we often put people on defined diets. Um, and we know that there are certain things that humans cannot eat. Um, so I think when you're trying to choose a database, you know, choose, first of all, databases that have biological compounds. So that's why Knapsack and Kebby are good choices. But then what you really want is not only the biological compounds, you want compound databases that are specific to your organism. So if you're looking at ducks, it would be nice to have a duck database. If you're looking at E. coli, it'd be nice to have an E. coli database. If you're looking at humans, it would be nice to have a human database. And as I said, uh, you see all too often, at least when I review papers, people identifying cosmetic compounds in yeast, or drug compounds in bacteria grown in defined media, or rats uh, with licorice derivatives like anise, when that's not possible given the food they eat. Um, so really what you want to do is lear search against spectral database, whether they're experimental or predictive, with real provenance data. So this has been a major effort in my group for many years. Um, so at the University of Alberta, we've been creating database resources, organism specific or purpose specific databases for 15 years. The first database we started with was the drug bank. Uh, it's actually the most popular database of the suite here, but it, it links drugs, where they are, where they're found, drug metabolites, and also their targets. Human metabolome database followed shortly after, and so it's focused purely on human metabolites. That's called HMDB. There's a yeast metabolome database, that's called YMDB, uh, E. coli metabolome database, uh, a food database, a phytochemical database, contaminant compound database, a toxic exposome database, polyphenol compounds, an exposure database, and then there's several other pathway databases, which I'll talk about later, PathBank and SNPDB. So these are a, a different breed of database, but they're also designed to be more suitable for metabolomics. Um, you know, Kebby wasn't designed for metabolomics. PubChem wasn't designed for metabolomics. ChemSpider wasn't designed for metabolomics. Um, but these databases were. So the human metabolome database grew from what was called the Human Metabolome Project. Uh, it started in 2005. And that project um, obviously didn't get as much publicity as the Human Genome Project, but it did generate a lot of data. And it's been used to create the databases like the Human Metabolome Database, uh, Drug Bank, FoodDB. It has metabolites in metabolite ranges in urine and cerebral spinal fluid and blood tissues. It has detailed descriptions of all those metabolites and a lot of biochemistry. 
The project itself also was focusing on developing technologies like Bazel, uh, like GC AutoFit, and other tools, including even Metabo Analyst, to help improve metabolome coverage, data analysis, and throughput. So a lot's come from the Human Metabolome Project, and a lot of the things you guys are using today and will use tomorrow uh, originated with it. When we started the project and we were trying to figure out how big the human metabolome was, the only databases we could resort to were KEG and human psych. And at the time, they only had 690 metabolites. Uh, when we created the first version of the human metabolome database, we tripled that and we got up to 2,180 compounds and we were pretty excited thinking that was pretty much the entire human metabolome. And boy, were we wrong. So in subsequent updates, we've been adding um, more and more metabolites. And as of 2018, there are 114,000 uh, in the last release. We'll be coming up to a new release in another year. And by then we expect there'll be about 200,000 compounds along with close to two and a half million predicted metabolites. You guys have seen this picture before and just sort of breaks things down into them, which is the number and types of compounds there are. You know, within the human metabolome, there are food components and drug components and toxic environmental components. There's also literally tens of thousands of environmental contaminants, things that you get from your clothing, things that you get from um, the air and from what you drink. Um, so the numbers of compounds just keeps on growing. Some of them are at levels that are too, too low to detect, but others are actually quite prominent and we still don't know why or what they are. I'm gonna talk about a few of them in a little more detail. Um, the Human Metabolome Database, HMDB, uh, FoodDB, Drug Bank, and the Toxic Exposome Database. So Francis and others asked, how do you distinguish between microbial metabolites and human metabolites? And it's hard because there's a lot of um, overlap. Um, but HMDB, we have distinguished a lot of gut microbial metabolites, clearly. Um, We've tracked a lot of the normal and abnormal concentrations. It's linked to many different diseases. There's a lot of NMR spectra, a lot of MS spectra for both uh, ESI and EIMS. With the HMDB, you can also search against protein sequences because we try and link every metabolite to um, the appropriate synthetic genes or proteins. Uh, you can do spectral searches, MS and NMR. You can browse your pathways and pathway searching tools. You can search by structure. You can search according to specific fluids. You can do all kinds of complex relational queries and standard text searches, and everything's downloadable. These are examples of some of the pathways, the big blue thing there, and examples of some of the spectral viewing tools, which use JavaScript applets and allow you to browse or hover over spectra, uh, the detailed descriptions, the browsing tables. Um, you can open up a given metabolite and you'll see up to a hundred and some data fields that cover um, nomenclature and synonyms and formulas and structures, two and 3D structures, the taxonomy uh, using classifier, um, an ontology, which is still being developed, uh, all kinds of predicted information, uh, as well as spectral data and all of the spectra can be searched. Um, you can put in, um, peak lists, and you can choose different combinations of adducts um, and different subsets of the database, and it will give you the matches and the scores um, through these um, searches. So you can not only do MS spectra, but you can do MSMS, um, and so that will give you, and, and we'll search against both the known and predicted MSMS spectra, again giving you a, a, a score, it's called the fit or purity. Uh, you can do NMR spectral searching. You can put down peak chemical shifts and um, it will find matches or close matches to those. You can search by structures. They're applets, so you can draw a structure and it will look for similar structures, um, scoring them uh, by their structural similarity. You can go to various biofluids. Um, there's many different conditions and lots of information about the normal and abnormal metabolites for many different biofluids and many different um, metabolites. As I mentioned, you find you have to serve different groups. And so a lot of the work 
for the biofluids is oriented towards what physicians need work for but the spectra is more oriented towards analytical chemists um, a lot of the information on the molecular biology and biochemistry is oriented to the bioinformaticians who want to mine HMDB. These are some data sets um, tracking the changes of HMDB from 2006 to 2018. And you can see that in the early days, the numbers of compounds were kind of small. The information about diseases and disease links was kind of minimal. The stuff in red is probably the more relevant stuff in terms of both the number of spectra. Um, so now up to 430,000 spectra, um, uh, number of compounds with predicted spectra, GCMS spectra, uh, the large number of pathway maps, um, and a large number of reactions and ontology terms. We've been fixing the structures. Uh, unfortunately, most of the commercial software that's used to generate lipids um, just kind of randomly generates them. <laughs> Um, so we've been re-rendering lipids so that they can look a little more um, pleasant or standard. Uh, we've introduced, as I say, the spectral hovering so people can hover over MS and NMR spectra or peak spectra for both GCMS, LCMS, um, and soon NMR. We've improved the addict calculations um, and uh, fixed up some small errors that we noticed. Um, and um, have more than doubled the number of addicts that are calculable. Uh, descriptions have been updated and improved. Uh, we're still continuing that. Um, I spent most of my weekend this weekend updating about uh, 100 descriptions in HMDB. So curating uh, requires lots of work um, and we actively continue to curate these databases. Drug Bank, as I said, is the most popular resource. Uh, it gets around 40 million hits a year. Uh, it's used by most of the world's drug companies for drug repurposing. So when COVID hit, um, uh, lots of things started lighting up in Drug Bank uh, because everyone is using it. And the reason why they use it is because it links drugs to drug targets. And a lot of people find that very useful for something called drug repurposing. So this is what they're trying to do uh, for COVID because it will take 10 years to approve a new drug for COVID, but if we can find an existing drug based on its binding properties, um, you have a potential uh, lead. Um, so it includes both small molecule drugs and experimental drugs. It has lots of information on mechanism of action, metabolism, pharmacokinetics, lots of information on drug metabolism and drug metabolites and on their drug targets. Toxic Exposome database, I briefly mentioned. It's a smaller database, but focused on the toxic compounds in drugs, pesticides, herbicides, disruptors, solvents, carcinogens, things that are nasty and things that you don't want to have in your body or in the water or in any, any other animal. But it's modeled very much like a drug bank. So it has a lot of information about the toxic uh, targets, um, the genes and chemicals. It also has a lot of the reference spectrum. One of the more popular databases is, is called FoodDB, and this is a little outdated. So there's now more than 70,000 compounds in FoodDB. Um, it's been updated. It still hasn't been published, but in fact, it's our third most popular database behind Drug Bank and HMDB. Um, and the fact that you can find literally thousands of compounds for anything from an apple to an orange to your cereal um, is quite intriguing, and it's certainly taken us a in new directions to look at um, what is in your food. As we've been evolving to more of the microbiome and also looking at things like wine and beer and bread, um, yeast play an important role. And so we've created this yeast metabolome database uh, that covers a lot of um, data for wine compounds, um, yeast metabolites and different growth substrates, a lot of the gene and metabolite associations, many spectra, and now there are many more pathways, probably several hundred pathways now in the yeast metabolome database. E. coli, uh, also uh, an important microbe um, and uh, certainly a model microbe. And this is our effort to also extend the microbiome uh, metabolome 
Um, so sorry, David. I, yeah. I need to interrupt you. <laughs> um, if you went back a slide to the yeast page, uh, is uh, so I I totally agree with your 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 gripe about sort of integration of of many of these databases with their various organisms and so forth. And uh, one, do you actually link or subclassify these metabolites on, uh, because you can take this to a whole different level if you want to, not to the genus species level, but to like strain level. That's with right. respect to metabolites. Yeah. So with yeast, we're mostly modeling after C services. So we don't have some of the specific strains. Um, and when we started the database, there wasn't a whole lot of strain data. Um, but yeah. um, the... Um, and what about uh, linking it with uh, folks uh, at SGD, the Saccharomyces genome database? Or do you already do that? Um, I think we provide some links to their uh, genome data through us. I don't think they link back to us, um, but... Yeah. I could, I could, I'm on their SAB, so I could uh, work here with them, with you. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Oh, super. Thanks. No, because I think, I think it's a, huh? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, I mean, um, I totally agree with you. And, and the, the challenge is, I'm also, as you know, I'm an editor on the database journal. And there's, I, I see a lot of databases, you know, popping up all over the, the planet. And there's a lot, I, I'm, and I'm not challenging you on this front, but I'm saying this is a general comment. There's a lot of people that just reinvent the wheel. And, um, and so the ability to actually integrate with existing resources and make each other stronger and better, I think is a really sort of uh, important thing and it requires extra work because it requires, you know, APIs. It requires, you know, sort of these databases to programmatically sort of talk to each other. And and because, as you alluded and mentioned a few times, when I mean, the curation is, is sort of lab very labor intensive, and if you can have some of this programs that actually make the links between the various uh, types, because they do pathways, they do. Uh, and so SGD does do pathways and they do keep strain information when it's available and they do keep, you know, there's a lot of, and like, like one of the big industry, of course, that's interested in this is the wine industry. And, and of course the wine is using yeast strains, which are proprietary. And, but if they, but they obviously do a lot of metabolomic analysis and so forth. So uh, it's a, it's a very interesting space to explore further, I'd say. Yeah, no, I think so. And those are great, great points. Um, you're right. I think in the world of databases, there's a lot of reinvention of databases or databases of databases. Um, I think one of our challenges, but also one of the strengths uh, is that, that the databases we create are, are, I guess I'll say original. So uh, they are the oh, yeah, yeah. for a lot of other databases. <laughs> Um, yeah. No, absolutely, and I think I mean, and and the the credit and the, the the mark of such databases is that they get used. I mean, so I think databases that don't bring anything don't get used, and the ones that do bring new things and new integrations and new perspectives and new linkouts and new link-ins and so forth do get used. And you know, you having something used millions of times a year is is definitely a true sign of success and and uh, bring something new to the table that didn't exist before but uh, i you know i've worked yeah i've, I've worked with many databases as myself yes, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah for those of you who don't know that you know francis cut his teeth at the ncbi and worked in many of the key databases that everyone now uses um, I used to be in charge of Gen, I used to be in charge of Gen Bank, so <laughs> <laughs> you may have heard of that one. <laughs> yeah. So um, maybe I'll, we'll just carry on here, but just um, sorry. Yes. The I think the point is that the E. coli metabolome database is really I think a, a very useful segue into people. I know there's a lot of people in the class that are doing microbial metabolomics, and this 
this was designed specifically for that. Uh, of course, the number of pathways has increased quite a bit over the last year or two, uh, but it has lots of, of um, reference spectra. And though I, I, a lot of people might use EcoPsych, um, the database there uses a lot of um, literature curated stuff, which um, you know has things like ampicillin as a, an E. coli metabolite. And that's because people put in ampicillin to stop E. coli. Um, it's not, um, it's not a, a, an E. coli metabolite. So tools and databases like uh, these um, organism specific ones um, or purpose specific databases that I've mentioned allow you to produce and annotate um, those lists of metabolites. Um, and uh, we've given you some examples in the lab, and then I've shown how some of these databases can also be used to identify metabolites. But what they do is they produce lists. And lists are nice, but what we really want in biology is understanding. And pathways are a vehicle to both integration and understanding. Pathways link metabolites to genes and proteins, but they also link it to physiology and to pathology and to many other fields. So I'm going to talk about pathway databases here, and I think in the interest of time, sort of speed things up a bit. Most of you are aware of the KEG database, certainly the most popular pathway database in the world. Um, some of you have probably used BioPsych or MetaPsych. Um, they started about the same time as KEG, and that's maintained uh, by Peter Karp. Um, others of you have heard of Reactome. That's uh, also done through um, activities in Toronto and EBI, and, and Francis, I think, has also been associated with Reactome for a while. And then something that most of you've never heard of is called SMPDB, or the Small Molecule Pathway Database. I'm going to talk about all four of them um, briefly. So they're a great source of biological data. They relate genes to proteins to metabolites, to diseases, signaling events, and processes. Um, they often cover multiple species. They're very visual, and we are a visual species. Um, KEG, as I said, is something that everyone has, knows about, and that there are many KEG wiring diagrams and many KEG sub um, uh, databases. Um, so, it is, sorry, sorry, I, I know I'm going to interrupt you and I'm slowing you down and it's and students are saying, where the hell is he stopping David, but I'm going to do it anyways. So sure. is KEG, um, KEG ran into some financial problems? That's right, yes. As um, uh, they resolve these problems? Well, it's, it's certainly up and operational. Um, you can't download KEG like you used to. Up until about five or six years ago, you could download vast quantities of data. I think some people have been able to figure out how to get some of it downloadable. But if you, if you want yeah. the local database, you have to pay money. Um, so, you know, it's, it's still viable. It's still doing some great work, um, but like a number of databases in Japan, they've had to move to a sort of a fee-for-service model. Um, okay. But you can still view it. It's still publicly accessible. It's just the downloads and sort of the extra bells and whistles cost money. Um, it covers a huge number of organisms, uh, 6,000 organisms. Most of those are microbial, about 99% of them. Um, it has sort of a standard set of 500 pathways about a hundred and some pathways um, uh, for humans and about 85 for microbes. And those are just sort of recycled. Um, they have some disease pathways and some protein signaling pathways. Um, um, the number of compounds in KEG is relatively small. It's sort of stuck at around 18 or 19,000 compounds, but it covers you know, all species of life, plants, microbes, animals. Um, it doesn't do a good job separating them, right? No, it's a bit of a pain. You have to know um, yeah. you have to select which pathway and then some things are highlighted. Uh, some of them are kind of dubious. You know, you'll find in a human pathway, you know, chlorophyll synthesis sort of thing. So you have to realize that no, this is just a generic pathway for all plastids. Um, so yeah, it, it's not, it's, it's limiting. Um, I mean, it doesn't show what's inside. So most people who use KEG don't, don't know that um, the TCI cycle takes place in, in mitochondria uh, because the KEG doesn't actually show things like mitochondria. So everything just kind of happens in space. Uh, it doesn't show transporters. 
So obviously something that's produced in the cell has to get outside and stuff that the cell needs that has to get inside. So there's almost no information about transport. Likewise, almost all of keg metabolism pathways are on catabolism and anabolism, yet probably 90% of what metabolites do is for signaling. And so we have kind of a warped view of the world uh, in metabolomics, thinking that everything is about um, catabolism and anabolism, and that's fundamentally wrong. And part of that's because keg was developed in a time before metabolomics existed. Keg was developed specifically for um, pathway uh, analysis, uh, sort of a, an obscure field. Um, and, oh, it was to complement biochemistry textbooks. Yeah, basically, you're right. So it was yeah. it had a different purpose. Uh, and it, they still yeah. maintain the purpose, but it, it really wasn't intended to help uh, or enrich metabolomics. It's just that people found it in the metabolomics world and they've made use of it. Um, instead of like, you know, you found a sailboat and now you're using it to, to fly down a, car, a, a highway uh, by sticking wheels on it. Um, so we've repurposed keg in the, in the way that it really wasn't intended to be. The Reactome database um, has, has been developed over the last 15 years and it's an effort, a joint effort at the University of Toronto and also um, EBI. Um, Originally, it evolved as a pathway for signaling, uh, but then has expanded to include metabolism. Um, so there's about 15 model organisms. Uh, there's about 1,500 pathways in each organism. So it's not as uh, extensive as, as uh, KEG with 6,000 organisms, but it covers disease, metabolism, signaling, transcription pathways. So the, the, the organisms are distinct. distinct. Yeah. So they're, they're much more careful, yeah. And it reflects the fact that originally Reactome was, was about protein pathways and protein-protein interactions. And then uh, metabolism kind of got added a little after the fact. Um, you know, obviously each of these databases deserves quite a bit of time, but we don't have that. So I'm just sort of flying through. Uh, BioPsych uh, includes EcoPsych, MetaPsych. This is the Psych collection or Cyclopedia collection. Uh, covers many different pathways, so it's a very large collection. Uh, so it's similar in concept to to CAG, but has much smaller pathways. Um, it has some pathways that are manually annotated uh, and uh, some they're not. So the number is huge, but everything is sort of automatic. Um, the model organism that BioPsych used was E. coli. So it imagines that humans are just larger versions of E. coli. Um, so you get some kind of queer, odd looking pathways in, um, in biopsych. And as I say, most of them are single reaction pathways rather than you know, large complex ones like the TCA cycle or the lipid synthesis cycles. So as I said, most pathway databases that have metabolic data in them just show catabolism or anabolism. And that's the idea that metabolites are just bricks and mortar. But I, as I said at the beginning, metabolites are much more than that. They actually play huge roles in signaling, the immune function, people have heard of immunometabolomics, inflammation, homeostatic events, epigenetics, most of that's driven by methylation processes, that's purely chemical, drug action, tissue repair, Cancer is looked on more and more as a metabolic disorder. Almost all the chronic diseases, including even Alzheimer's, appears to have fundamental metabolic uh, and signaling um, relationships. And so the, the role of metabolites and their signaling, immune function, immunometabolic mix and inflammation had nothing to do with catabolism or anabolism. I mean, the most important signaling molecule in your body is called glucose. And many of you are probably feeling a glucose low right now. Some of you drifting off to sleep. Um, if you get something sweet in your mouth or in your stomach, it'll get you working again, but it's not just activating your brain. It's actually activating a whole range of other actions. And this is an example of a molecule that's around five millimolar in your body. And so the number of, of receptors and proteins that glucose activates is amazing. And none of it's shown in keg. 
None of it's shown in Reactome, none of it's shown in any database, frankly. So we're missing a lot and we're misinterpreting a lot because of that. So it was partly because of that and those problems that we started creating this database called the Small Molecule Pathway Database. And we decided to create a database specifically for metabolomics to try and capture those things that weren't in traditional databases. So this is sort of its layout. Um, every pathway has a description. Every pathway is colorful. Every pathway has some information about where the processes happen within the cell and within the organelles. There's almost 50,000 pathways now. Um, some of them are metabolic diseases. Some of them are metabolic pathways. Some of them are drug action. And more and more are related to signaling pathways. We tried to get information about compartmental um, organelle information quaternary structures of proteins and try and relate not only the metabolites, but also proteins and genes to that. And so you can take an input gene, protein, or chemical metabolite lists and upload them to SMIPBB and it'll generate um, matching pathways or disease diagnoses. This is an example of a pathway uh, showing information about how this particular thing, which is, can't even read it here, uh, it's too small for me to read, but um, how it links to actions in uh, the brain and muscle and other tissues, uh, highlighting where the action takes place in the mitochondria, uh, how some of the metabolites move between peroxisomes and other organelles, uh, how some mutations have made this particular enzyme non-functional, leading to higher levels of this metabolite, which cause brain and muscle damage. Um, so um, you can see the membrane. Uh, ideally, you'd, it would show how the metabolites were pumped in or brought in or kicked out. Um, and all of the metabolites are linkable to HMDB. Um, as I say, every pathway has a detailed description with lots of references. Um, and um, you can indicate which metabolites need to be highlighted. And so they will be colored in red in the, in the pathway. So this is through the SMIP mapping. Um, you can also um, include concentration data, and then that will color the pathways according to different ranges, ranging from yellow to red to green, depending on those concentrations. Um, the proteins are all linked to Uniprot. As I said, the metabolites are linked to HMDB. You can re-render the pathways in color or black and white. You can make them look like uh, keg if you want. Um, you convert them to color or printer-friendly versions. They can be in different uh, graphical formats. They can also be stored in systems biology markup language, biopax format. There's a pathway format um, and systems biology graphical notation formats. Um, all the pathways are downloadable. All can actually be edited. So if you want to contribute to PathBank and SMIPDB, you can use a tool, an online tool called PathWiz that allows you to make these machine readable pathways. So you can access it through this way. And by drawing a pathway through this tool, you automatically create a pathway that is fully compatible with Biopax, SBML, and SBGN. Uh, it has a drawing, a bunch of drawing palettes um, and allows you to add reactants and enzymes and different biological states. You can render lipids as this way or simple ones. You can drop and drag things, rotate things as necessary. It's all done on the web. Um, there are various icons to illustrate, you know, the liver or the ER. Um, all the metabolites are rendered automatically. So if you provide a name, it'll generate the metabolite and name it. Um, it's tools to facilitate the preparation of proteins. Um, and this is an example of one that's been generated, in this case, lipid biosynthesis, showing things that are happening within organelles or within the ER or within different parts of the cell and how uh, all of this primarily takes place in the kidneys in this particular case. There are videos on YouTube. There's a journal of visual editing um, um, or education in, um, about how to do pathways with PathWiz. 
Um, you can also, when you draw one pathway, you can propagate it to other organisms or you can replicate it when you're making pathways that are very similar. So that saves a lot of time. Um, so you can take the organism's pathway for Arabidopsis and then propagate it to grape uh, wines if you have um, the genome associated for it. Using PathWiz and SPEPBB, we were able to generate a large number of pathways for 10 model organisms uh, recently and produced a resource called PathBank. So this now has a little over 100,000 pathways for humans, fruit flies, yeast, C. elegans, E. coli, mouse, rat, cow, Arabidopsis. And like SMIPD supports the SBML, SBGDN, Biopax, and so on. Um, it has a lot of, in this example, plant pathways and plant compounds um, from Arabidopsis, so it's quite extensive. Um, certainly allowing people to uh, now, or hopefully in the few, near future, to visualize SNP or gene variants with different colors um, and to render it in these black and white or color forms. We compared PathBank to a number of other databases, um, Wiki Pathways, Biocarta, Reactome, both in terms of their size, the scope, um, the type, the linking, the signaling, um, drug action, descriptions, um, summaries, and so on. Um, in some cases, PathBank is as good. In some cases, it's not as good. In some cases, it's quite a bit better. Um, each pathway brings its own strengths, but as I say, our focus is to try and highlight or bring in more information about signaling pathways for metabolites, drug actions, because drugs are chemicals, uh, disease pathways, and other things, and to sort of change the way that people think about pathways in metabolomics. So I've gone through a lot of databases, and I've tried to do it fairly quickly, um, but they're really key to compound annotation and data interpretation. Um, Many of the databases that we traditionally use weren't really intended for metabolomics, but we just sort of found them and have repurposed them. As I say, it's kind of like finding a sailboat, putting some wheels on it and using it to go down the highway. It's, it's not what a sailboat was intended for. Um, so what we need to do is, you know, either as a community redesign them or enhance them. And so um, I'm trying to highlight some of these newly emerging databases like PathBank or SMIPDB, highlight some of the other uh, organism-specific databases that many people may not be aware of. In metabolomics, the provenance, the origin of metabolites is really key to reducing false positives and, and incorrect interpretations. And in most metabolomic studies, we know exactly which organism we're looking at. So if you know that, use that information for, for helping you in your data analysis. <clears throat> 